All right, it is 6.10. So hello everyone, welcome to week four of Silicon Valley Startup Success. And today's topic is gonna to be all about business model and how to make money. So let's get started. Our agenda for today consists of a 20 to 25 minute topic overview. And then we have a really exciting speaker uh, who will be giving a talk and then we'll be having a Q&A session for you all to ask your questions. And then the remainder of the time will be for the discussion as usual. All right, so let's begin by talking about what a business model is. It's simply a way of creating, delivering, and capturing value or revenue. And it's a really concise or neat way to represent all of these aspects in one single view so that it's easier for everyone to understand. And this definition is from the book, Business Model Generation, which is a great handbook, 10 out of 10 recommend for anyone trying to iterate on a business model. And it's a really good read. One of the most recent and popular ways of representing the business model is a business model canvas. And that's made up of nine key building blocks. And there are two different aspects to it. So on the left side of the canvas, that's all about the creation of value. And then on the right side of the canvas is all about the delivery of that value. And these two are bridged by the value proposition. And this is a really great way to show everything at once. And uh, this is personally what I use for my startup as well. And you can see uh, the business model canvas have a huge uh, board with a lot of post-its. So it's a great way to iterate on anything. So let's do a quick rundown of all of the building blocks. So key resources. That talks about the most important assets uh, that are required to make a business model work. Uh, so for example, like employees or software, raw materials, finance, et cetera. As for key activities, that's all about the most important things a company must do to make its uh, business model work. Uh, an example of that would be software development or manufacturing, et cetera. Key partnerships. That is the network of suppliers and partners that make the business model work. Cost structure. That basically just describes all of the costs incurred to operate. So that could be something like rent or the employee's cost or the cost of production. Uh, let's talk about customer segments next. Uh, customer segments are the different groups of people that a business aims to target or reach and attract. Channels, that's how a company communicates with its customer segments to deliver the values. So that's like the how customer relationships. They are the types of relationships a company must maintain and continuously maintain to manage the customer segments. And then lastly, we have revenue streams and that represents the cash a company generates from each customer segment. And value propositions, which is very important. That's one of the most critical elements that glues the entire business model canvas together that glues the value creation side of it, as well as the value distribution. So a few examples of value propositions uh, include cost reduction or increased revenue or increased profits. Today, specifically, we're going to be focusing on the revenue streams aspect, which is all about monetization of the value that your company offers. So the question that we'll be answering today is, how do you make money out of your business? There are quite a few business models, um, but I will be going over some of the most commonly used ones. So let's start off with the long tail model. And that focuses on a large number of products, each selling in very low volumes. So an example would be, let's say Netflix in the media industry. So Netflix has a license uh, where they license a large number of niche movies. And while each niche movie is rented relatively infrequently, the aggregate revenue from Netflix's large catalog that really tops that from the rental of 
blockbuster movies. And the main point here is quantity. So a graph to kind of reinforce the point. You can see that the long tail focuses on a large number of products, which each sell in low volumes. All right, so the next one is multi-sided platforms. What they do is uh, it creates value as a broker by connecting these different customer groups. So let's take an example of Visa where my dad works. <laughs> so Visa caters to the banks on one side and they simultaneously provide value to the merchant population. And then they also, they familiarize the Visa brand name to consumers. So more and more people use it. And the key for any multi-sided platform is that it must attract and serve all of these groups simultaneously. So if you think about it, if merchants don't accept Visa products, then consumers can't use it. And if the consumers don't use Visa, then it's really of no use to the merchants. And similarly, if a critical mass of merchants and consumers don't use Visa, then there's really no value for the banks. So what Visa needs to do is that it needs to ensure that it provides a great value proposition to all three of these segments. And that's how Visa makes money. Visa monetizes by brokering the value to all three of these customer segments and groups. All right, so the next one we'll be covering is free as a business model. And there are several patterns that make integrating free products and services into a business model possible. So some traditional Free methods include advertising, um, and I'll give an example of that. Or also the freemium model, uh, which just provides basic services um, for free to consumers, but then they charge a fee for premium services. And we all know about Google, where most of the products um, are free to consumers, and they make money on advertising. And a fun fact is that more than 70% of Google's revenues comes from advertisements. So that's some food for thought. And an example of uh, um, advertising would be Metro, which is a newspaper. And even though the Metro newspaper is free for the people who want to read the news, they actually make a lot of money uh, just by charging businesses or firms who want to use the newspaper as a platform to uh, market something. Um, so that's how free Metro works. And the last example of a common business model is the open business model. And this is an example of where companies attract external ideas, technologies, and IP um, into its development process. And they monetize through this process. So you may have heard of Henry Chesborough, who's our own director here at Haas School of Business, and he coined the term outside in innovation, which describes this process. So go bears. <laughs> all right, and again, this focus um, of today's particular session is all about making money. And I'm so excited to have someone who has mastered and enjoys the process, um, and I'm super excited to hear from him. So Ryan, we are extremely happy to have you share your thoughts and perspectives on this topic. And we're proud to be associated with you through UC Berkeley. Uh, Ryan is the founder and CEO of Flexport, which is a Bay Area startup and is a unicorn. In fact, a multi-billion dollar unicorn. And I really cannot do justice on explaining what Flexport is. So requesting Ryan to talk about the company and the million dollar question. Oh, sorry, scratch that. The billion dollar question. <laughs> How do you make money? So take it away, Ryan. We're so happy to have you here. Great. Awesome. Thanks for having me, everybody. I'm thrilled to be back in Berkeley. I wish I could come in person and hang out on campus. Um, so I love this question. I love the fact that people are thinking about how to make money. It's all too rare in this world. Um, and uh, and I, I actually, um, I prepared some thoughts, but maybe I first introduced myself and introduced Flexport a little bit. Um, Flexport is a, we're a platform for global trade. We're a technology company that makes trade easier 
Uh, you ship something across the world. Turns out there's like 12 different companies that have to get involved in that chain. And it's a, it's a mess. It's very complex, uh, highly regulated and, um, and really expensive. And so our, what we're building is a platform, is a trading network. It's effectively allowing all the importers and exporters to make it super simple for them to connect uh, exchange orders. So you can place a purchase order to the supplier uh, and then all the logistics asset owners of the world so that you can execute the shipment. So that's trucking companies, ocean carriers, airlines, railroads, warehouses, customs brokers. Um, so it's a multi-sided marketplace. I think you had multi-sided marketplace on your list there somewhere. Um, and um, so that's, that's sort of the business model. We make money off the transactions and it's a um, very complex business. I think that's a, one of the things that's valuable about it. It's really hard for someone else. It's really hard for us to do it and really, really hard for other people to do it. Um, okay, so that's Flexport. I'll tell you about myself a little bit. So I graduated from Berkeley in uh, 2002, um, which was a right after the dot-com bubble. Not a lot of job prospects for me. I, uh, one of my, at that time in my life, my core value, my number one value in life was, was not making money. In fact, it never has been. It, it was, at that time, it was really about adventure. Um, I think actually my biggest value in life is learning and it still is. I'm a really curious person. I like to learn. Uh, and adventure for me was like a way to learn uh, at a very fast pace. Um, so, um, for example, I've been, uh, give you a couple of adventures and they're not always, in fact, some of them are horrifying. They sound fun in hindsight, uh, but I have been in a high speed motorcycle chase where um, in West Africa, where bandits on motorcycles had uh, machetes and their motorcycle went slightly faster than mine. So that it took, uh, it took, a, it was a slow motion nightmare. It took me, um, took them about 20 minutes to actually catch me, but I could tell that they were gonna catch me. Uh, I've been on a bus that was hijacked in El Salvador and the guy put a hand grenade, grenade in my face and said that if I looked out the window, he would throw the grenade at the, at the bus. Um, and, I, and these, in hindsight, they're a lot of fun. I think it's actually a lesson in that. that uh, it's a great story. And I uh, remember these fondly, even though it was like the worst feeling on planet earth being there. Um, and I think Helen Keller was the one that said, life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. <laughs> Um, and that was probably my mantra from when I was like 13 years old. I lived in, a, I lived in Spain when I was 13 with a family, um, without my parents actually. Um, and that was probably my mantra until I was like 30. Um, and so I visited 40 countries. I speak five languages. I really just had a, like a lot of fun with it. I never sought to make money. And I actually think that that is a core lesson when you talk to that core, the question, how do you make money? Um, one, you must like money and you need to train your brain that money is good. Most of us have been subconsciously programmed to believe that money is bad. Uh, for most of human history, the people with money got it by stealing it from other people. Uh, that since the dawn of free market, free market uh, economics is no longer how the great fortunes are made. Um, that you know, corruption still exists in a lot of places, but most of the great fortunes in the United States are made through entrepreneurship. Uh, and that's increasingly true in other countries as well, um, that most people made money in, in entrepreneurship, you make money by creating value for other people. Um, so I think that's the, my first lesson. And it's like, not, this is barely even a business lesson. This is a moment, this is a lesson for individuals, for you as people, is that you have to want to make money and you have to kind of reprogram your brain to want money, um, that you'd be shocked at how rare this is of people wanting money. I promise you, most people on this, uh, on the audience here, you are subconsciously, you hate money. Um, I know this because most people in society hate money. I look around all the time and I'm shocked at how easy it is to make money if that's what you want to do. Uh, and yet nobody does it. So I know, and, and Berkeley is, has a particular bent against uh, making money as, a, as an institution that I, um, so I think, trust me, you have this problem. We all do. It's a, it, um, and so that's the first thing you have to step is really look at yourself deeply. Why do you want to make money? What is it good for you? Why, why will it help you? Um, and that you, there, there are some, make sure you have a really good list, list of reasons why you want to make money. Uh, for you, for your business, what are you going to be able to do with it? What is it going to do for you? What are you going to be able to do for the world? Um, some reasons that I like making money uh, gives you freedom. I never want to have another boss again in my life. I don't like being told what to do. When I was a kid, I only wanted two things. I wanted 
a, a walkie talkie so I could talk to my friends and I wanted to be an adult. So nobody would tell me what to do. Well, I got my walkie talkie and, uh, and now I'm an adult and I'm free and I don't have people telling me what to do. And it's amazing. So number one, having money means you don't need to have a boss, which is really cool. You, hopefully you get great bosses and, um, and, and they help you a lot in your career, but it's better to be your own boss. Um, second money lets you solve problems, your problems and other people's problems. Um, my life is so much easier because if there's a problem, I can spend money to fix it. That's what money is for. People who have big problems and then don't want to spend money to solve the problem, like misunderstand the point of money. Um, that is what it's for. It doesn't, you can't bring it with you when you die. Um, money may enable you to attract a better mate. Sad, but true. That is how the world works. It'll help you be healthier. I have a personal trainer. Uh, you can eat better, healthier food. These things cost money. Get exposure to great ideas and great people. Um, one of the secrets of like what's awesome about running a successful company is and or being successful at anything, you know, great piano player or something. If you're the best at something, you get to meet all the other people who are the best at what they do. And those are awesome people to hang out with and your life will be more interesting and richer and more fascinating. Um, and I, I think um, you have to find your own reasons. These are some of my reasons. And I think there's probably more. I, and I under us um, didn't talk enough about how impactful money can be solve other people's problems. Um, and that is like the ultimate reward. The secret to living is giving and finding ways to give back and support things and do awesome causes. So, but you got to have money. And, and, and if you don't have great reasons to why you want money, trust me, your brain is subconsciously programmed and it will repel money. It'll go away from you. It won't, it won't, we want to come in the same neighborhood as you. Um, if you have, if you, so when you, what ways that you can reprogram yourself, Next time you see someone who's really rich driving a nice car, instead of being like, ah, oh, that loser, go, wow, cool car. Ask him a question. Uh, you see, you know, you, 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 you see the rich and famous, instead of being upset that they're rich and famous, be happy for them. That's awesome. And, try, you know, you don't, if, you, if, you're, if you're pissed off at the rich and you're jealous, like, I promise you, you'll never become rich uh, because your brain will be like, oh, that's bad. Why would I want to be like that? Um, so, and by the way, if you don't want to love money, that's okay too. It, it's not for everybody. But the question, the topic is how to make money. Uh, and number one, you got to want to make money. Um, second, you got to know what money is. What is this thing? Where does it come from? I mean, it's just a piece of paper or a digital bit. Where did it come from? Why is it valuable? Um, and for this, I think an, an understanding, this is a complex system and it's not an obvious question. Why, what is money? Uh, all it really is at its core is a representation of, of wealth, which is slightly different from money. Money is a form that wealth can take, uh, but m wealth can be ownership in a business. Wealth can be a piece of land. Wealth can be an object. Wealth can be many things. Uh, money is just a fungible, much more fungible form of wealth. Um, and so where does it come from? Uh, at its core, money has to come from something being productive. Uh, we, are, we are making something that's useful for other people. And then we are exchange, the exchange, mutual exchange of value, gains from trade. Hopefully some of you have gotten a chance to take uh, economics class. Most of what you'll learn in macroeconomics is like pretty useless, I found, but microeconomics can be a really useful subject. Uh, and understanding Ricardian, David Ricardo is the economist who first documented the gains from trade that take place. Understanding that is a key to understanding how the world works around you. Every time that there is a gain from trade, every time a two, two parties trade with each other, I buy something from you, we both got a little bit richer because you gave me money, but I gave you something that you valued more than money by definition, right? Or, or you wouldn't have done the trade. Um, and so we have just made an increase in the amount of wealth in the world by doing that transaction. And so the more transactions that take place in an economy, the, the more wealth is created. Um, and those gains from trade fundamentally is the source of money. Um, and we, have, we are very fortunate to be born in this era uh, where these, these trades have been going on for a long period of time. Uh, we've had free market economics uh, in some sense for you know, in different parts of the world for 50 years, 100 years, several hundred years, depending on not everybody was allowed to be part of that free market system, but more and more people are, are being allowed to participate every year. Uh, hopefully it, it continues in that trend and doesn't go the other way. Um, and 
Okay, so that's one sense of like, where does money come from? Second, I, a very good concept of, of money and of the economy is to remember that the eco in economy is the same eco as in ecosystem. These are the, it's literally the same Greek origin of that word. And it is a much easier way to think about an economy is to think about biological systems. And you have different companies that occupy different niches just as organisms in, a, in an ecosystem would do. And that they consume inputs from their ecosystem and put outputs out. And there is all this ex mutual exchange happening just in the ecosystem. You have a tree that harvests its soil and you got all kinds of bacteria in the soil. And then the things, uh, birds live in the trees and uh, companies are very similar to this. Um, and, and people that, companies are nothing more than a group of people that have decided to join forces and pursue something very similar to our, us as human beings are nothing more than a group of cells that have chosen to align forces and pursue common interests. Um, so I think understanding, having a good view of the economy uh, as a complex adaptive system will help you understand where money comes from, what it is, how, where it comes from. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit more now that we know why we wanna make money and what it is. How, how do we get that? What is our business model was the term uh, that we're using in the beginning of the class, but how are we gonna do it? Um, I think, well, if it's science, what we need is an exploratory algorithm. Um, the algorithm of evolution is, uh, let's see if I can get this right, it's diversify, select, and amplify. So first we wanna have lots of options lots of experiments in genetics. This is many, many random variations. Then we're gonna select for the ones that are actually successful, the rest die. Uh, and then we're gonna amplify the good ones, right? Um, similar things can work in business. You wanna have a lot, large portfolio of bets. Now, any individual might only be able to do one thing and do it well, but as a society, we wanna have a large portfolio of lots of different experiments and different angles and different occupying different niches and try different things. Um, try to avoid direct comp competition. If you are um, gonna go head to head with, if you're gonna to try to survive in an ecosystem and you've got this alpha apex predator tiger you probably gonna lose if you try to also be an apex predator tiger, unless you have bigger claws and run faster and more muscle and all that. Um, so what's your niche? You might be able to be a great little hummingbird and hide from the high tiger. Uh, and so really understanding, this is where you really need to understand a market and see like, okay, what are the experiments that are likely to pay off? What do I wanna try? Um, and so it's then once you've got that, it's scientific method, right? You're running an experiment. So I've got to find a problem. Let's generate some hypotheses for how I could solve this problem. And you've got to solve a problem where you're not creating value and you won't make money. So find a problem, generate hypotheses, test some lightweight solutions, super lightweight, ideally. So you can run iteration cycles really fast and repeat that. Um, and this is not, doesn't have to be a huge risk-taking endeavor, especially if you can organize your life so that you're not spending too much money. Um, keep your expenses low to try to pay off your student debt. You might have to get a job and pay off your debt first. Hopefully you all don't have too much debt. Um, but, but that's the scientific method. And ultimately it's about generating lots of ideas. You have to be constantly alert to the problems that are all around you. We are all guilty of schlep blindness. Schlep is a Yiddish word for an arduous journey. Uh, and so we are all guilty of this, that we, any, any problem that is, too big, we just, our brain shuts it out and we can't even see it. We're totally blind to the biggest problems in our lives. Um, and so you have to kind of train yourself out of that too um, and, and be able to really get, let yourself get a little bit pissed off about problems. By the way, this is where experience comes in and why um, right out of college is not always the best time to start a job because you may not have seen all the industries and all the problems that are, that are in these industries. You might not have, um, experience is not just like, oh, you need X years of experience. It's like, oh, you have to have seen the problem and experienced it before you can even know that it's a thing that you can go and solve. So nothing wrong about getting a job. And certainly if you have debt, go get that job, pay down the debt, um, and, but be alert to the problems. And most organizations, most people um, are totally blind to the problems that are around them. 
And you'll see that most people in most organizations like have no idea. They just accept things that are like so stupid. That, why does this company do it like this? Why is this industry organized like this? Why is there not a piece of technology that solves this problem? Um, the problem with idea generation is that your idea is only valuable if you're the only one that has it usually. Uh, and so when you don't have a lot of experience, you end up coming up with ideas that come from routine, ordinary human experience. And well, everyone else has that. And so other people probably found the idea and you'll find 10 people doing the same idea. Um, and so you've got to be able to find an idea that's different from other people. Even a really, really good idea, if everyone has it, ends up being useless. Uh, competition will suck all the profits out. Um, but yeah, so be constantly alert to problems and let yourself get pissed off about them. Uh, you channel that energy into generating hypotheses of how you could solve it and running experiments to test uh, scientific method. All right, so then the next question, I'll be like, well, who can help you to make money? And there is a uh, amazing hack out here is that most of the world's smartest people who have ever lived have made it possible for you to actually live in their mind and literally have their thoughts be your thoughts. It is a magical thing that most people don't do. In fact, 99% of people in the United States read less than one book per year, uh, which is insane. I don't know if that's, that's true, don't quote me on it, but it's crazy how few people read. And you have the opportunity, the smartest human beings who ever lived have written down their best ideas and taken the time to make them like concise and legible unlike when they were actually live and talking and you could it would take you years to distill this stuff and they like took the time and wrote it down and it's all there for you and you can get it for free especially on campus there um so find a role model someone who's a cheat this is true whether you're trying to make money or do anything else find someone who's done that thing and learn from them uh and you don't even have to meet them in person you can read uh there by the way a lot of these people are now on other ways besides reading you're on twitter they're on youtube um so find role models who have done this. Some role models that I think are pretty powerful for making money, I would definitely cite Jeff Bezos and Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. I think Sheryl Sandberg is pretty inspiring and has done a great job writing down her ideas. Kathy Wood is one of my new favorite investors, uh, investor in disruptive technology. Um, Tony Robbins is amazing on making money. There are so many, but find your own. Um, a hack for those of you who don't like reading that much, Shame on you, you will get there. You must find something that you like to read. You can read whatever you want. It doesn't have to be about making money and then find a love of reading. Uh, but there is a hack because I love to read, but I also I haven't even read all these books yet. They're just there as props. I've read a lot of them, but not all of them. However, the ones that I haven't read, I have typed the author's name into YouTube and they will. you will find a 20 minute interview with the author and you can get at least half, maybe 80% of the value of reading the whole book through a 20 minute YouTube lesson. I have in this ma manner read as many as eight books in one day. Um, so good little hack to go and find more information. Find people who've made great money. A couple of uh, books that I will recommend in this area. Uh, the Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin is one of my favorites. Uh, was an entrepreneur before there was even a word for that. Uh, brilliant lessons on making money. In fact, he wrote a whole newsletter called uh, Poor Richard's Almanac, I wanna say, uh, which was all about how to make money back in the day um, and was an entrepreneur in the printing press industry. And he's a media mogul in distribution and content be way before the internet. Um, Tony Robbins, I've mentioned, has a bunch of good books. A great book for investors is The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Uh, my favorite book for understanding the economy is called The Origin of Wealth. Uh, which is this concept of the economy as an ecosystem, as a complex adaptive system. Another great way to understand the economy, by the way, is search uh, YouTube for Ray Dalio, how the economic machine works. 30 minutes must watch. How does the world actually work? Um, and then for those trying to do a startup as a way to make money, and it's probably the best, best way to learn, maybe not the best way to make money, but uh, highest probability of making a lot of money if you want to just make money, get a job as a programmer, but the highest probability of making a ton of money, you're also more likely to make zero, but uh, is, um, is start up, starting a company. A um, couple books there. I really like The Four Steps to the Epiphany, uh, E-Myth, Mastery. There's so many good books about starting companies. So 
uh, any book that you want to read is good. Get get fall in love with reading. I didn't have this when I was your age. In fact, I made it. I made it through high school without ever reading a book. Um, I'm literally I use Cliff Notes and and I don't know how I did it, but I got I got into Berkeley without reading a single book that I know that I can remember. Maybe the textbooks, but basically never read a book. Uh, Berkeley, I read the books that were assigned in class, but never had time to read other books. Um, for better or worse, uh, I didn't. I don't think I really fell in love with reading until I was like 25 years old. Um, and there somehow I hit on a couple of subjects that I was like, wow, this is fascinating. They really did it for me. It was like studying evolution, uh, the history of the world, uh, evolution, the, the economy, how they all tie together, complex systems. These were things that for me just like sparked a vein and I just have been reading dozens of books uh, a year ever since. Um, okay, so that's a bit about how, um, who can help you. Of course you can learn from friends, but find role models and the internet has made it amazing. They're on Twitter, they're sharing their ideas, uh, they're, they're writing books and learn, you know, but I would, on the who question, I would tell you um, people who think that you're lame for wanting to make money, they're probably have a wrong mental model of what money is and where it comes from. And they're probably used to the old world of zero sum game and those who have got a lot of money stole it from others. Um, and in the old world, what you had was status instead of money. Yeah, instead of wealth, which is non-zero sum, you can grow the pie and make more money for everybody through trade. Uh, in a status game, there's only a limited amount of status that can exist in the world. It was why Hollywood is never going to be as helpful as Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley, new people come in, we try to help each other because it's not zero sum. We try to grow the pie and make it better for everybody. Hollywood is zero sum. There's only 10, you can only have so many stars. Uh, if you become a star, I got to lose my, you know, there's only so many seats and, um, and that's a zero sum game and therefore it's not going to have a great culture. Um, so playing win-win uh, games, not zero sum games with long-term people, I think is a key aspect of, of making money. Find friends who want to support that. If you're, if you're, if you find people who are poo-pooing your company or why do you want to make money or money's terrible, you know, these capitalists, rich people, uh, you don't owe them anything. You can cut them out of your life. Like they're, they're going to drag you down and be toxic. Uh, or you can allow yourself to be dragged down, but you won't make a lot of money. Um, that's the choice you can make. I'll leave it to you. Um, in general though, people who are toxic, you don't owe them anything. You can move on. Life is too short for that. Uh, okay. Let's talk about when you should work on this when you should work on money, making money. Um, notice I'm, I'm doing all these questions. Question, the human brain is designed to answer questions. So be careful with the quality of the questions that you ask yourself. If you ask yourself, why am I depressed? Your brain will answer and find a bunch of reasons to be depressed. But if you ask yourself instead, what am I grateful for? What am I excited about? What am I passionate about? Your brain will instead answer that question. So be careful what questions you ask your brain and try to be conscious of it. Um, and so my next question is, when should you work on making money? Well, until you have a lot of it, you work on it all the time. Um, keep a running list of ideas to make money. A running list of ideas, what that means, again, problems to solve. Have a list, have like a little app that's easy for you to use where you keep lists and list down things that are terrible awful problems in the world. Um, awful problems, if you can solve them, you'll make money. Climate change is a good example. Look at Elon, he's working on climate change through Tesla. And he's now the richest person in the world. Awesome. Um, find problems and you will find that if you can solve it, you'll make, you will make money. So keep that list. Um, activate your brain in and looking at people who are really successful. Watch them, study them, learn from them. Um, one idea would be, again, in the sense of the world is not really fair, but there's a more or less, you get what you deserve. Uh, you get what you put out. And so find people that you can help and make lists without expectation of return. Don't try to keep track of it, but make a list of 10 ways that you could help people. When you go to a networking event, which, you know, maybe you need to make some more friends or find different friends that want to help you more. Um, don't go there for yourself. Go there for other people. How do you help those people? Like make a list of what you could do to help them. When you find uh, a company, find all the startups at Cal. Ask Siri what her startup is. Make, and make a list of 10 ways that you could help her with that company. Uh, 
ask nothing in return. Just and maybe maybe she's already thought of all the ideas ideas. But trust me, you do this enough, it doesn't cost you much. It's fun, and you will find that the world starts returning those favors. So do have a sense of uh, karmic. There is there is karma in the world. It's just uh, it's called transactions. I give you something, and eventually I might get something in return. It doesn't have to be mystical. Um, although totally cool if you believe in that. Um, okay, so that's a bit on when. I think the last question would be um, where. I, I got a why, uh, who, what, how, when, and then where, where do we make money? Um, well, historically cities have been pl where places make money. They, they, they have grown as centers of commerce and exchange. And as I've said before, commerce and exchange is where money is created. Um, and so that's the reason that cities exist literally is so that to make it easier for people to transact. And every time they transact, they're generating wealth. Um, and so while it's beautiful to live in the countryside, there's a reason that there's not a lot of wealth in the countryside, except for people who made it in cities and then moved to the countryside. Who knows, maybe the pandemic is gonna change that. Maybe now with remote and internet technology you can live wherever you want. I'm gonna bet against that because cities have existed since the dawn of civilization, literally it's the same root of the word civilization and city. Uh, 10,000 years of humans living in cities and that's where the wealth is generated. Yeah, there's some new technology. I don't think it's going to replace that convenience of people getting together and, and engaging in commerce. So pick a city wisely where you want to live. Um, if, if you want to make money, you're going to want to live in a city where you can make friends, make connections, help other people be part of something bigger than yourself. Um, we're lucky here in the Bay Area. San Francisco is probably the greatest, the most dynamic center of wealth generation uh, it's in a hundred years. It is amazing to be part of it here and to be close to it. Um, but yes, the internet is changing things. So be able to, now you can connect and do business all over the world. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing. I, I, we do Thanksgiving as our tradition in the United States. Every year I give for the last uh, 16 years running, I've given thanks to the same thing, which is the internet. It is an amazing invention. Connect to anybody on planet earth. We don't know what it's going to lead to. Um, the fact that 900 million people in Africa now have Wikipedia in their pocket is the most remarkable fact on it, that we don't know what that's going to lead to, but it's going to be beautiful. Um, and so the internet allows you to find your tribe too, for everybody, no matter what you're into, maybe growing up in high school, you were a dork because you were into some weird thing. Uh, now I guarantee you find Oops. Thank you for muting, muting that person, but you muted me too. Um, and so the internet is awesome. So find your tribes on there, connect, find people who are working on similar things, find problems to solve on the internet. Um, huge potential, obviously. All right, so that's my where question. It's like, it's probably a city, but you better be plugged in on the internet. Uh, my friends who don't use the internet, well, I, they are not doing that well in life. Um, my high school buddies who did not realize how powerful the internet was the way I did uh, have not had nearly the same amount of success. So get, go all in on that. Um, okay. So that's a little bit of answering the questions of like about money. I want to leave you some actionable takeaways and then we'll turn it over to Q and a, um, some, a couple actionable takeaways. I already gave you one that Ray Dalio talk on how the economic machine works. I think it's a must watch. I've watched it a half a dozen times. I make people watch it. Um, Really well done. Dahlia is a very successful guy, runs the biggest hedge fund in the world uh, and therefore has money. And he did a great job producing an awesome talk on how it works. Uh, watch that. Make sure you understand it. Um, start your ideas list. Find a, find a to-do list app. I use one called Things, but you can use Trello. You can use whatever you like, Google Docs. And just have that list and know where it is. And then when you see things that are either pissing you off or 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 you can also write a list of people that hate money. That's another one. And you'll find them every day, every single day. Um, you know, restaurants or there's nobody at the counter when you show up to seat you and you make you stand there for 10 minutes. Like that, these people not want to make money, just have someone there to seat you. Uh, you will find dozens of these businesses that don't answer the phone. They send you to talk to a robot. Like I'm calling with a credit card. Why would you not answer the phone? Um, start, so maybe start those lists as another one. Um, I would think that other idea that I gave you was like, make lists of ways to help others, make lists of ways to help other businesses. So 
find a couple of your friends who have startups or companies that you like and make a list. You don't even have to send it to them. Make a list for yourself of like, how could you help this? What would you do to help this business? What could they do to be more famous uh, to get the word out? Um, I think those are some good next uh, takeaways. Uh, another one might be um, try to make yourself more well-known for something. Um, learn, learn about a subject, create content, put, make a video online, make a, write a blog post, like get your name out there a little bit so that you have an opinion and put your, put your, uh, put your words behind your actions and, and, you know, to stand up and take some accountability. The world rewards people who take that kind of risk. Uh, um, and, and I think that that's another thing that you could do, but in the meantime, yeah, I think it's keep putting that good karma out in the world. Know that we no longer live in a universe that's zero sum game. We no longer live in a world where, uh, where you, the risks are much less than they used to be for thousands of years. If you stuck your neck out, you'd likely get it cut off. Uh, for thousands of years, if you were standing in front of a large group of people, they were probably about to kill you. And now they're probably there to listen to your ideas. And yet we all still have that terrible fear of public speaking. We all still have that fear of going out and taking a risk. Uh, but most things are now asymmetrical, that your downside is limited. Uh, we don't have a, it's certainly limited in terms of like, there's no debtor's prison and, and you're unlikely to suffer physically. Um, and there is even social safety nets these days with unemployment insurance and other things. Uh, so your downside is relatively limited. Your upside is infinite. So take more risks, um, try things, go for it. Like, I don't think you have that much to worry about is, but you remember that your brain is programmed for a different world. Uh, your brain is programmed for a world where it's zero sum, high risk, protect myself at all costs. And, uh, and so the, start with you, start with your psychology. How do you overcome some of that? And with that, I'd love to hear how this landed with you. What are some questions from the audience who would like to break the ice and go first? Yeah, Yash, go for it. Um, can you hear me? All right, um, firstly, fantastic. Kind of, I really do appreciate the speech and uh, it's, it's been kind of very uplifting and very engaging, so thank you. Um, my question is right now, I have this like, idea, I've built a prototype and I'm struggling to push it out to the customers. I'm scared to kind of put that out there in terms of testing, um, doing that alpha beta testing to see if there's any kind of market fit. Mm. Um, how would you kind of advise in going going about that um, scene? Um, yeah. Well, first of all, it's okay to fail. It's okay if there's no product market fit. Uh, so try to do that early. I'm not saying fail is good, failure is good. It's certainly not, but it's okay because you'll learn and, and your goal should be to learn and keep, keep iterating, keep evolving your idea until you find the right thing. Um, it, remember that ecosystem mindset, like, yeah, most things are going to die. Thankfully it's not you, it's just your idea. Uh, but the good ones will really take off. So you got to expose your ideas early to markets to see if there's demand there. Um, it's great to have a vision and, and believe in yourself and believe that you know the market, but you don't know uh, until until you find others that agree. What I've done in this area, I've, I've started, um, we mentioned Flexport, but I've actually started four or five um, successful companies and um, successful as measured by tens of millions of revenue. And um, what I actually try to do is push my idea way before I've built anything and make sure that people are like signing up. So I, for Flexport, I built a landing page uh, offering what is now Flexport you, three years before we got licensed and started the company. It was just a landing page. Would people sign up if this did exist? Um, so that's the best signal is lots of people signing up. And ideally, I, I remember I went to graduate school for business and um, we had a class on like market research and like, how do you know if someone's ready to buy your product? And they had all these, the, the, we went around the class and there were all these ideas around surveys and panels. And I was like, what if you just made a fake product listing and posted it and see if anyone buys? And I, the professor literally laughed at me like I was joking. I'm like, wait, I'm not, I wasn't joking. Like that was a good idea. Uh, and, and, yet, and then after graduate school, I started Flexport using that exact um, model. So I think uh, don't be too in love with any one idea. Be instead organize your life so that you can't fail. Minimal debt, 
find ways to make some money. Maybe it's consulting. Maybe, maybe you do some engineering contracting work. If you're an engineer, if you're a marketer, do some consulting for SEO, help people drive growth, like find some stream of income because now or teach that SAT, you got into Cal, you probably got a good SAT scores, find some way to make some cash and pay your rent. And then boom, now you're like, and keep your expenses low, eat cheap food, cook for yourself, whatever. Um, don't go out too much. And then boom, like now you stay in business forever and you earn permission to keep testing lots of ideas until you get one that works. Um, that's a recipe for entrepreneurship without the risk that I think a lot of people blow up because they are so in love with one idea. When it fails, they, they feel less of themselves. Like I had some stupid ideas. One of the companies I tried might, might work, uh, but I think I'm, I don't think so. it, it didn't work for me uh, was I wanted, you ever see those signposts that then like point to like 60 city or like 30 different cities with the number of miles to get there. And I was going to make this web app that you could like create one of those on demand and say what cities it would go to. Uh, zero people wanted that besides me. And I never sold any, but I didn't waste any effort. Like I just had, a, I didn't code it. I just had a landing page. Like would people use this? And maybe I should have coded it, but not built the whole back end to like cut the wood or whatever. But I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, but I was just experimenting, you know, and like trying things that I like. So don't fall too much in love with your idea. Uh, expose it early and often. Um, so go ahead and try it, you know, and like, don't, it doesn't, it's not like you expose it once and that's it. Like, iterate, get feedback, talk to users, um, and you'll eventually find the right thing if you stay in the game long enough that you can't die. For sure. All right, thank you, appreciate it. Who's next? I have a question, actually. Oh, great, yeah. Yeah, so I was just reading about some Netflix news in 2011, and then they tried to increase their price by, I think, 60%, which led to like, million customers canceling their subscription and then stocks dropped by 77% in just like three to four months. So it, it seems like price adjustments are very sensitive. So how do you go about fine tuning or adjusting your price for a product or service? Um, and yeah, how do you, do you have any general advice about that? On I mean, how to price things? Um, really there's no one size fits all answer here. Um, and, and be careful with spreadsheets and rational decision-making, um, because you're selling to human beings and we're not rational. We are human psychology is anything but rational. Um, and so, um, in classical neoliberal economics, what they teach you in school, it's wrong basically, but they teach you that the only way to get to sell more units is to lower your price. But, for a lot of products, you could raise the price and people will like it more. Uh, I don't think that if um, Gucci lowered their prices, they'd sell more purses. They probably sell less purses. Um, you, you, you know, and so, uh, and they, they, they do, of course, have terms for this as gift and goods, but they act like they're this super rare, weird thing. And in fact, I think they're much more common than you would expect. Um, take my favorite example of this comes from um, Rory Sutherland is my favorite uh, applied behavioral economist check him out on YouTube, Rory Sutherland. And um, he, he talks about, let's say you were um, trying to take on Coca-Cola and you talk to some classical economists, then they would tell you, uh, okay, I got to make the product taste a little bit better. Maybe it's a little sweeter or just like, let's do a whole bunch of surveys and have people taste it and see that ours tastes better than the blind taste test. Uh, I probably want to make it a bigger can so you get more value for your money. And I'm going to make it cheaper. Uh, Coca-Cola has been around for hundred years. The, the company that's done the best in challenging them made a product that tastes disgusting, comes in a tiny can and costs a fortune. It's called Red Bull. Uh, and so you gotta be careful, like just following classical economic logic. Um, surveys are really dangerous as things, uh, but experiments are not bad. Make sure that, you know, don't listen to what people say about what they do. Um, and so lots of little tests. I think it's easier than ever with the internet to test different price points. Hard when you're Netflix. A lot of what companies do, uh, I don't know how Netflix is internationally if their markets are too different from one another, but this is big global companies have an advantage. A lot of what they do is test, use New Zealand as a test market uh, because it's kind of similar culturally enough to the United States and to Western Europe to the core markets, but it's like the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So the tests don't need to... Uh, Find, people don't need to find out that they're doing something different over there than here. Um, 
So that's, that doesn't work for startups. But I, I don't know. I think um, in general, you're going to price for things what people are willing to pay. Um, but there is a real room for psychology in pricing. I'll give you an example. One of my companies I started is called importgenius.com. Uh, we sell data uh, on global trade. And we used to have three plans. They were called uh, standard, premium, and enterprise. I want to say, yeah, standard, premium, and enterprise. And they were $99, $199, and $399 per month. And one day, I came up with the experiment to run where we changed, we didn't change the price or the attributes of the plans. We only changed the names of the plans. We changed it from, instead of standard premium enterprise, we became limited standard enterprise. Human psychology, nobody wants to be limited. Uh, we went from a 60, 30, 10 ratio to a 30, 60, 10 ratio. We doubled the revenue of the company by changing one word. Uh, didn't change anything else. It was the greatest AV test of, that I'm aware of of all time. Uh, the, really one of the only AV tests I've done that was really successful. Um, and uh, so think about psychology. Like it's not always classical. Uh, classical economics doesn't have any room for psychology. And when they do, they call humans weird and biased and like problematic. And it's like, actually like, we, there's reasons for our psychology. They mostly came out of our very torturous evolution that we all went, our ancestors went through on the savanna. And, uh, and there's reasons for it. And you can, understanding it will, will allow you to do pricing better than the rational free market econo economists in your finance team. Thank you. Yeah, I'll yeah. really consider psychology. Yeah, I didn't you need know to learn it. One it. of the most important things. Check out... Um, Robert Cialdini's book, uh, Influence. Yes, got it. Yeah, it's on my to-do list now. Um, I remember taking AP Psychology in my senior year of high school, so I'll just have to go back. <laughs> um, I, never, I never took a psychology class, and I have a feeling that they're not that useful. I think they end up teaching you, like, weird Freudian stuff and try to <laughs> delve into your subconscious and stuff. It's like, no, look at – I would look much more towards um, behavioral economics is what it's now called, uh, applied behavioral economics and – understand humans decision making things like that rather than like yeah. childhood trauma or something i don't know what they teach in psychology class never took one yeah. yeah i'll definitely read that book thank you um if i may ask another question so you you, you kind of mentioned that you've started various different companies um seen various like you know uh, pain points for consumers at what point do you kind of navigate through your Kind of five, six, seven, eight ideas that you have, and determine which one's the best to implement at a certain time. Because I feel like I have a couple of ideas I want to start with, but I've kind of pushed with one, which I don't think I'm as confident with compared to the others. But mm. I've done far much more work onto this. And um, it is totally okay to have parallel. Try a few things in parallel, um, and I would do that. I, I would have four or five different experiments going at once to see which one's got traction. Um, and, and the, the way I was getting traction was basically posting landing pages of companies that I thought should exist and then seeing which ones get signups, even though there's no product built yet. Um, I, at that time, this was like 12, 12 or more years ago, I was like pretty good at um, search engine optimization and getting things to rank in Google. Uh, Google has changed a lot. I don't know how to do it anymore. Um, but um, if you can... Five, and it's probably now it's like getting influencers, getting, getting to appear in TikTok feed algorithms, like understanding where, uh, how YouTube rate stuff. How, but, um, but yeah, if you can drive traffic to a site um, and then see that people are actually, the best is people signing up, like a, even with a credit card, like you can always refund the money, but like if somebody's willing to pay, you have a business. Um, and if they're not, you might not. And I would be the, the easiest thing when you don't have a lot of experience is to start a consumer startup because you're a consumer and you know how consumers think, but um, don't underestimate the scale required to do a consumer startup. Like I have a, um, one of our product managers at Flexport has a music app that has, that he did before Flexport. And it has, uh, he told me it has like 60,000 daily users 
which is like phenomenally successful by any human standard. Imagine filling an entire stadium worth of people to listen to music. Like if he could do that in the real world, he'd be like one of the world's most successful people. But on the internet, it's just not enough money. It's, there's no money in that. You need to have millions of users before you make money. Um, so don't underestimate the scale required in the consumer world. Um, B2B, I like a lot better because uh, if I got 60,000 people to pay me a dollar a month, I'd be doing just fine, right? Um, so B2B, it's like a little bit easier to get money to get people to pay you for something. Yeah. Thank you. Who else has a question? It doesn't have to be about making money, but I'm uh, love love to answer any questions that you got. Can I ask? Uh, uh, maybe. Oh. Go ahead, Artem. You had your hand up first. Cool. Uh, maybe a stupid question, but uh, still, I want to ask: uh, Is like making, you know, starting something without a clear business model in mind even like a thing, or uh, like should it be pr prioritized to kind of you know run experiments uh, in greater detail first to kind of know where you're going? Sort of like does it make sense? Well. It's hard to find anyone who didn't have a business model. Like, I think it's overplayed when they're like, oh, Facebook didn't have a business model. I mean, it's like kind of obvious they were going to make money off ads. Like, um, if you're a consumer startup, that's probably the business model. I don't know. What, 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 what's an example of something where you're like, uh, like to start something, but I don't know what the business model is. Uh, the thing I'm trying to do, <laughs> honestly. Is it just like a useful, cool tool that you think is would should exist? Mm, yeah, pretty much. I think so. That's cool. Honestly, go for it. Be creative. Do stuff if you like it. Like it's not the world's not all about making money, and like the world is also very unpredictable. Uh, there's upside opportunity that you don't know where it'll come from. Who knows? Maybe that thing doesn't make you money, but someone uses it and likes it. Like for example, um, my old head of product, who's now um, he's a, I actually hired him right out of Cal. Uh, who's now a, an entrepreneur in his own right. He had a project, he had a site that made maps and sold them online. And it, he just thought these things should exist. You should be able to make a map. It was actually a consumer generated map. So you could like choose a city or an area and then it would print like a beautiful map for your wall. Um, and he built that and like, yeah, there was a business model there, but it wasn't, an ob it was never a success. And I think he knew it was never gonna be a huge success. But it was part of why we hired him. We're like, hey, you're a creative guy who like built a fully baked company product, even if it's not the best pro company, like it's cool. Like I ordered maps and put them on the Flexport offices early days because I was like, these are good. So um, don't feel like everything has to be awesome and perfect or uh, things are awesome. And not everything has to make a ton of money to be awesome. Um, and it's still, you know, you can still do some cool stuff. And success compounds would be one of my other big lessons. I should have hit that in my main talk is like, uh, we say the the negative way to say this is the rich get richer. Um, but the reality is that success compounds. It's not just that you, the rich get richer. It looks like that way because of the nature of compounding that it looks like only the people up here are, are surging, but actually every little win that you have can build on the next win, build on the next win and, and go until you end up getting this compound curve of success. Um, and, and, at the time, it might not look like much, you know, just like some little traction, somebody liked your site. Uh, so yeah, go for it. It doesn't have to be a perfect, perfect moneymaker. Thank you. My earliest business was buying motorcycles, motorcycles in China and selling them on the internet. It was not a great company, uh, but I learned a lot about global trade. I learned a lot about import export customs. Uh, I learned a lot about business finding customers, building sites, building uh, tech. We built a lot of uh, backend technology, like basically sort of NetSuite style systems to run the business. Um, learned about China, I lived in China for a few years doing that. I, did, I, my maximum, my income was so low, like I didn't make a lot of money, but I learned a lot, you know? So focus on the learning, especially at your age, still coming out of college. Like it's all about learning and building your skill set and making, you know, connections and it, you will it might not seem like much but success compounds and you'll keep building towards something uh more awesome there was another person oh we got i see there's a hand raised sam we'll go with you turn on your video if you can can you can you hear me 
Uh, it's a lot of feedback. Uh, hold on one second. No, nah, it's better. It now? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I now. Uh, it's still kind of whack. Hey, Sam, why don't you fix that? We'll take William's question and then we'll come back to you. Okay. All right. I'm getting a feedback loop from you. Yeah. Hey, William, go ahead. Hey, thanks for coming here. And I think that's the speaker. Um, when you have a speaker on, it's kind of, you know, the mic catches it and then it has that, that resonating effect. Um, my question is uh, you said you made a couple landing pages and then um, it got popular. There was clearly a demand. So um, what's the next step? Like back then, entrepreneurship is not really a, a thing yet. It is a thing, but not so popular. I, I'm not that old, man. This was in 2008. <laughs> Ten, Google, <laughs> Google was founded in 98. And so I was, I'm not that old, but, uh, but yeah, what's the next step? Is that the question after you get some yeah, traction? Like, like funding wise, and then, you know, getting the funding, getting the backup that you need, like the support. Yeah. And so this is an interesting um, topic it is funding and I Flexport, I've raised um, a total of $1.3 billion, actually 1.353, uh, $53 million. Let's not leave it off. Um, so um, I've raised a lot of venture capital. I had done business for, let me do the math, 12 years uh, of grinding in businesses before I raised my first dollar of venture capital. Um, and I think that was, again, success compounding. Like I, my first business, that importing business was like a real it was not a great business. It was really hard. We worked really hard. We didn't make that much money. We might've worked even harder than we have to work now. Sometimes you work harder in a bad business than in a good one. A good one is sort of just like, you're full of joy and it, you, know, you attract a better team and it, the, the world just sucks it out of you. Uh, bad business, you gotta just fight through all the pain every day. Um, so I'd done it for a long time. Uh, so at the time that I started to get that traction, actually the big barrier for us was getting licensed. Um, and that no amount of, I mean, yeah, you can use money to over with higher lawyers and stuff, but ultimately you're at the, the whims of the government to get in compliance and getting, I had to go through an FBI background check. It took me years to get the license after the moment that I saw that if this existed, we could make money. That was a really tough time for me. Cause I'm like, I just want to do this. Like the, and it took me years to get the government licenses. Once I got the licenses, um, from there it was um, start, you know, building tech. We uh, I had made money in my previous companies, so I was able to fund it myself for a while. Um, in fact, I the Flexport the first million. I should put another million dollars down because I funded it myself for the first million uh, with money that I made in a, the data business before that, um, and, and and stupidly didn't do the paperwork right, so I didn't get any extra shares for the money and I never got paid back, but it's fine. Um, uh, and, but, uh, funded it myself, but again, it's like, the answer is not, Oh, you need to have a million dollars. You can't do a startup. It's like, no, I paid my dues. Like I built stuff that didn't need money. Um, and so whenever I find an entrepreneur is like, oh, I'm going to do this if I can just get funding. I'm like, you're probably not going to succeed because there's so many ideas that don't require any money. Be a, and they're maybe not as awesome and home run ideas, but you got to earn that. If the, if the investors won't back you, it's probably because you don't have the track record of smaller successes to build on. Um, and so I, and then kind of at the same time, investors can kind of tell that you're going to do it with or without them. And that was when I ended up raising venture capital. I think that was the air I was able to project was like, like I'm funding it myself right now and I'm just going to keep funding it. Like I don't need you, which wasn't really true. Like Flexport needed a lot of venture capital. Um, but I had that mentality that I was going to do it one way or the other. And that's when people want to invest when you don't need the money, when it's like, Oh, I better get on this rocket ship. Right. Um, so earn that, you know, it's not just like make a better pitch. Uh, it's probably not make a pitch at all. It's like make a cool product, start to get some early wins, some success, uh, and then build and go from there. Uh, Kenza, go ahead. Uh, hello, Ryan. Um, it's a pleasure hearing you the second time I heard you last semester at the Richard Newton series. Oh, okay. Yeah, I try to come to Cal as often as I can. Yeah, that was really nice. Thank you. Um, and this also, my question is, um, out of all of your businesses, like, which one is um, your favorite, like, top? And what are the four reasons of its, like, success? 
like the four best reasons. Um, oh, it's, hands down, it's twice more. Um, greatest thing ever is the greatest company in the world. Best business ever created the history of mankind. Um, I'm only kind of exaggerating. I freaking love Flexport. I think it's so high potential. Um, best things are, one is that the world is changing really fast towards an e-commerce first world. Um, and the businesses, every business has to make that shift and it's really hard to do. And our supply chains, how we ship the freight, the products to get them in is not built for the dynamism of e-commerce. Um, in, in the old world, you ship everything to one site and serve the whole country from one location. You're not gonna get two hour delivery if you're doing that. Uh, so you kind of have to edge cache all your products all over the world. The old world of supply chain is not made for that. It's a lot more shipments. It's a lot smaller shipments. Um, it's, it's, it's run much more like a network with a hub and spoke set up to get the goods close. And by the way, if you ship too many goods and they're gonna sit unsold in North Dakota, because you're trying to provide two hour delivery in every town in America, that won't work either. So there's an optimization here between enough product in stock to sell and not too much that it doesn't sell and you go bankrupt. Again, it's for algorithms, not, not really for people um, on the phone. So I think we're in a, just a, an amazing space to be able to solve problems that really matter, honestly. Like one, it's empowering entrepreneurs. There's a whole new breed. We want to arm the rebels and allow people to come and, um, and build cool companies and take on the Amazons of the world. And two is all the awesome brands. Like I, Toys R Us went bankrupt and I don't know anybody. I, I'm so, I'm the only person who like cried a little bit. Like, are you kidding? It's Toys R Us. Like that was like my childhood going to Toys R Us and it went bankrupt and nobody seemed to care. It was like, oh, dude, who cares? It's some shitty retailer. I'm like, no, dude, it's Toys R Us. Uh, I think that's really bad. Um, and I want to help companies like that to run better supply chains. I don't know enough about their circumstances, but I think a lot of the times it's like they didn't adapt to e-commerce. They didn't build for the new world that we're in. They have too much uh, bloat, too many people pushing paper and not creating value for the organization. Um, and so I think we're just an incredible place to do that. And then we can make a lot of money because our business is a platform and it's a technology platform that connects all the parties. And there's a lot of services that you need to participate in global commerce. And we just keep rolling out new services and without a lot of incremental investment and, and providing those to customers and creating new value and capturing a piece of that. And so we just keep finding new ways to make money. Um, we went, last year we did $1.3 billion in revenue. Uh, one of the fastest companies ever to hit a billion dollars in revenue uh, in the history of the world. And, uh, and we're still like zero, we're less than 0.1% market share. So a lot of reasons to love Flexport. For um, people that work here, like the thing that is really fun in part from like having a great vision and huge potential, it's also a really cool place to learn because we get to see all the companies and see, meet the people who are building new products, like all the top e-commerce brands are our customers, meet their teams, um, learn about why they're successful or some of them fail, what was wrong, uh, see the product in the wild so you can kind of touch it. A lot of software companies like, there's nothing to, especially enterprise software, there's nothing to see. For us, it's like, look at those container ships and then the products in the stores, like it's all um, kind of much more tangible. And so I think that's a really cool like learning opportunity. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, Juliet. Hi, Ryan. Um, thank you so much for being here. So my question is, you know, you mentioned um, keeping a running list of problems that you encounter um, throughout the world. Um, and what problem did you encounter that made you think and want to make Flexport in the first place? Yeah, so, well, I, I mentioned that I used to have this business uh, with, actually, it was my older brother was the founder of the company. I worked for him uh, buying motorcycles in China and selling them through the internet and through retail, uh, through car, used car auctions, actually. We sold a lot of motorcycles in these auctions. Um, and every time we imported a container of motorcycles, it felt like a nightmare. And I felt like the... George Bernard Shaw has a great quote. Um, Every profession is a conspiracy against the laity. And I felt like the freight forwarding was the poster child for that. They were just trying, they knew more about what was going on. They had all these code words. They would rip me off. They would have like unexpected fees and documents I never heard of. And if I didn't have the document, I'd have to pay a thousand dollars a day. I mean, it was just kind of crazy. Um, so that, they, and there was this, this culture of like taking advantage of the customer instead of 
one of our core values at Flexport is playing the long game and trying to, we do marketing as education. We try to teach people how it works, not try to take advantage. We're going to make money, but over the long term, not short term, uh, how much can I make off this shipment, but how much can I make off this company over the next 50 years? I think, I think, um, I hope that a good percentage of our customers will still be our customers in 50 years. Um, and if they're not, hopefully it's, it's not our fault. Something went wrong with their business, right? Which happens. Um, but yeah, so being in the world, right? Like that's a, again, where it's very hard to start a company out of college. We get this idea of like, like Zuckerberg or something, but like, it's kind of rare to have enough experience to really see the, the, the underlying problems. Um, so any opportunity you get to, that exposes yourself to like a new industry or uh, where, where the problems sit or find, meet people, ask them what the big, you know, we talk about networking and creating value for people, we'll ask good questions too. Like what are the biggest problems that, biggest sources of frustrations in your job um, is a good question to ask somebody when you meet them. Uh, Siri, you wanna ask one more question? Uh, yes, yeah. so I've heard about the 80-20 distribution of revenue. Uh, which is like the top 20% of customers bring in 80% of revenue. And especially for startup companies, I'm sure the ratio is very high. So what do you think is like an ideal revenue distribution? Um, I think that's, a, uh, th there's no reason that 80, that has to be 80, 20 um, at all. In fact, it could be 90, 20, or it doesn't have to add up to a hundred either. That, that's a common misperception. There's no reason at all that it has to add up to a hundred. They're, they're two different uh, numbers. Um, I don't know uh, that it matters that much. I mean, you don't want to be too focused on one customer because then maybe no one else wants your product and you're never going to expand the market. And yet, uh, so it's kind of nice to have lots and lots of customers, but I like big customers and less people to have to please. So I'm, I'm like, I'm relatively agnostic. Like I don't want any customer. I wouldn't want one customer to be 20%, but I'm fine. Uh, if, um, if I have 80, 20 or, or even 90% of my revenue from 10% of my customers, that's fine. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it matters that much. I think it's about getting, making sure that there's lots more customers like the ones you have is the hard problem. Um, and I've seen that happen in some companies where, they, the first customer they sign up is willing to pay a lot for their product and they mislead themselves into thinking they've got a great business and they go hire a sales team and then it finds out like, oh, that company was unique in some way um, and we can't get others and then they have to lay people off. So it's more about like, are there lots more customers like the ones you have? And, the, and if I add 80, 20, I mean, the way to solve that problem, if you did think it was a problem that you're too concentrated is, Go find more customers and sign them up and you'll change the ratio. Sam, let's see, let's hear if your microphone is fixed. I think it should be good now. Can you hear me? Yeah, you sound great. Can't okay, see you, great. but that's okay. Okay, all right, cool. Um, I have a question because we are talking about business models, but now I'm still not quite sure about your business model. You're talking about your logistics, shipping stuff. Mm. Can you just uh, describe your business model in a, maybe a concise way or just elaborate on this so, so that people can understand in, I don't know, maybe five minutes. And the yeah, other totally. thing is, the other thing is I, I, I'm kind of curious because we have the like unseen pandemic ongoing, still ongoing. How does that affect the business? Because I imagine there's lock, a lot of like, you cannot ship stuff from a certain area to a certain area for a period of time, lots of restrictions, stuff like that. Can you comment on it? Yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, our business model is pretty straightforward. We, we, uh, we manage global trade transactions and we charge per transaction. So you can sort of think of, um, we have a one number, one metric we track is gross merchandise value. What's the value of all the stuff that we're shipping around the world? Um, and, or even if we're not shipping it, that we're tracking, because we have products that let you track freight, even if you don't ship it with Flexport. Um, and so that's the first headline. And we count GMV for that too, um, because I'm just, what our goal is to get all the world's trade to flow in some way through our pipes um, or, or, man, or, or monitor it all. Um, so first is GMV. Then I've got a series of products. I've got about eight, depending on how you define it, eight or 10 different products that you can sell and attach to that transaction. Um, and we make money off of those transactions and each of the products that we offer, product is like, it's a service. Um, each of the services that we attach has a different conversion rate to profitability um, to you know, convert, um, let's say, what are my products? So it's ocean freight. So moving uh, cargo from port to port, air freight, 
airport to airport trucking, um, both on origin and destination. We do a hundred and we shipped to 109 countries last year. So trucking customs clearance, export and import cargo insurance, uh, trade finance. So we have a financing product you can borrow, uh, effectively borrow money. Um, it's not technically a loan, a loan but it's, a uh, Effectively, that's what's happening. That's a factoring, I guess. Kind of. I think they call it reverse factoring. It's like in trade finance, inventory financing. Um, um, what did I miss? Uh, a handful of other products that are compliance related uh, or customs related. And so each of those has a different profit margin and, 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 and you can buy none of it. You can just track stuff and there we, it's pretty cheap. Uh, or we'll try to sell you the full package of ship it from door to door. Oh, I forgot warehousing and distribution. Um, and we'll ship it from door to door, provide customs clearance, insure it and provide you financing. Um, and then it becomes a very high margin offering for us. So that's that's the business model is uh, managed transactions. There is a freemium element there uh, with just the track and trace product. Um, some of our other tools like messaging, supplier messaging, we give away for free product library. Uh, where you track all your compliance data about all your products. Uh, we do that for free. But a freemium has not been a big part of our story. It's been much more of a, um, in fact, our, we really lead, historically have led with shipping ocean freight for people. We're the third largest ocean freight uh, provider in the United States. Um, but, but the money's not in port to port ocean freight. It's really a commodity. Anybody can ship a container between two ports. Um, you make more money in the business model. It gets much better when you start layering in all those other services. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and then you asked about the pandemic. Um, well, the pandemic has been really crazy for supply chain. Um, first off, the factories all closed in China at the very outset. We saw this. Um, we got active really early. We have a group called Flexport.org that does humanitarian relief for logistics. And they activated right in January of last year. We saw that... Um, the pandemic had hit Wuhan. We had some nonprofit medical partners in Wuhan. Uh, shipped ended up shipping about three hundred fifty thousand masks to China uh, on behalf of them right at the outset of the pandemic, uh, which was a little embarrassing later because we shipped those maps from the United States to China, and then we found out there was no masks in the United States when the pandemic hit here. So our fault. Um, but um, so that was the first thing. Then our revenue went almost to zero for like eight weeks as all the shipping in the world stopped, as all the factories shut down. Uh, not to zero, but out of China was zero. And China is a big part of our business, origin China. Um, so that was at the, we were really staring at the abyss and we even laid, uh, laid some people off at the very beginning. We thought we were going to be in for really hard times and we needed to cut budget. Um, surprisingly, global trade is up 30% year over year, which is remarkable. Uh, global trade long-term historical average increased about 4% a year the last 800 years. So it grew 30%. So you had like a six, eight, year, eight years of uh, growth in one year. Um, turns out when you lock a bunch of people up in their house and you don't let them spend money at bars and restaurants and hotels and travel, they uh, buy more stuff because you got to get dopamine somewhere. And so everybody bought more stuff and the, the goods purchases went through the roof and imports went crazy. Um, that happened. Our, remember, our ports and ships are the same size, same number of ships and same size of ports. And our airplanes are half of them are grounded as a, as a human civilization. Uh, because of the pandemic, we're not flying passengers. Half the world's freight flies in the belly of passenger planes. Um, and so economics majors out there can tell you what's going to happen if the supply, if the demand, if the trade volume goes up 30% and the supply comes down by half, the price went up 5x uh, for air freight, about doubled for ocean freight. Um, so it really drove a lot of revenue for our business. Um, now it also increased our costs because we have to buy, pay for those things in the market. But um, on the balance, like real problems in getting things delivered, and you make money by solving problems. So we had a, we have had a good year for the business um, as a result of the pandemic. We're one of the beneficiaries, I would say. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, talking about China, how did the tariff affect in your business? Now it's new at this administration. Uh, well, I don't know what's gonna happen with the new administration. It looks like they're um, keeping it more or less status quo. I haven't, uh, and I, I'm not expecting them to be like way softer on, on, the, on the tariffs. I think they'll have a very different negotiating style, but I don't know that the end result will be that different. Um, tariffs have been devastating for our customers. We had a lot of customers had their tariffs increased by like 
you know, massive increases from zero to 25%, um, pretty traumatic. If you're running a business and your cost of your core product goes up by 25% in one day, a lot of companies had to shut down. Um, and uh, even the, one, the ones that survived like are much worse businesses and have to make some changes. Uh, we, you know, that's the customer paying the tariff not us, uh, but if our customers suffer, at the end of the day, we're gonna suffer. We were able to really differentiate where, because we're so data-driven, we're able to pull within within an hour, within five minutes of the new tariffs being announced, uh, we can pull a, a simple SQ, a SQL query to find out who is affected. Um, and, and then within an hour, their account managers are contacting them um, with the bad news and start start planning of what they can do about it. Um, there are a few solutions, but none of them are great. Uh, so we differentiated because our competitors never called and we were pretty proactive. So it gave us a chance to stand out, but it's still not, not, you know, our mission is to make trade easy for everyone and tariffs don't do that. So we're definitely opposed to tariffs on principle, even though there's reasonable reasons to do it sometimes. Uh, David, how, thanks for the question, Sam. Thanks for fixing your microphone. How about you? Yeah, David? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, right now I'm building something that has to do a lot with data. I know the Flexport obviously, you know, obviously has a lot to do with data. Um, from your end, uh, in terms of Flexport, I assume that at the beginning process of, you know, this entire this entire competitive process, it was all uh, manually input data uh, and then probably transition to automated. Um, as someone who doesn't have the funds to automate, uh, you know, data entry, data analysis and something like that, obviously the first go-to step is like Philippines. Um, paying marginal wages for 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 data entry like that. Um, do you have any other recommendations as to where I can get, I guess, like manual power to input data um, past past automation processes and and I guess like the Philippines and other types of uh, places like that? Um, I mean, I'm sure you'll find them all in Mechanical Turk and different uh, BPO providers that do data entry and that are pretty low cost. Um, there's a there's a whole generation of OCR. Uh, company startups that are able to that are pretty good these days. Um, you might check out Rossum, R O S S U M. I think it's Rossum.ai. I forget their domain, but if you Google Rossum, R O S S U M, that they have a pretty powerful. And it sounds like you're pretty technical. You could be able to use their APIs. Um, we use them. We augment our data entry people with them. Um, now we have to apply a lot more human power because it's so compliance heavy. So depending on your purpose, but like we're submitting this data to US Customs, so it needs to be really right and vetted. But for a lot of purposes, like Rossum's like 99% accurate. I don't know if that's really the number, but even if it was 99% accurate, it wouldn't be good enough for us because 1% of the time you're really having a real problem with Customs. Um, uh, whereas for a lot of use cases, 99% might be more than more than good enough. So, and, and they're not a monopolist. There's a lot of good tech. Uh, I don't know what OpenAI has in that area, but there's... Um, the, follow the ML space pretty closely. You'll see that data entry is kind of, which is really weird, right? It's like data entry jobs might be the first ones to get really disrupted by AI, um, which is pretty rough for countries that are just trying to build these like new services businesses and then finding out that like, oh, you machine learning. Uh, but that's the nature of free markets is like the job of a company is not to employ people, it's to employ less people so that you can have a cheaper product so that you can deliver cheap goods to the world. And that's how we benefit from capitalism. And, the, and then there will be opportunity because everything's cheaper. I can live off of less money and go start a new company. And um, so be careful from taking too much, feeling like it's such a bad thing when uh, automation comes. If, if it wasn't for automation, we'd all still be uh, sticking plants yeah. in the ground with our hands instead of using a plow. So ML and LR, they don't really work in like, uh, you know, pre-seed startup scale. Uh, just because those are obviously way more expensive than manual data. Um, no, so no, no, no. It should be much cheaper than manual. Well, programming a machine learning program uh, is definitely more expensive than. No, but that's what I'm saying. These guys have it. You don't need to write it yourself. That, that's you. You just feed them a document and they give you back the data. Okay, understood. Thank you so much. Yeah, check it out. Google has one too. Um, part of their. Um, but you do need to be a slightly. I do. You, are you a coder or no? No, I'm founder. Oh, uh, okay. Well, you might need to learn how to code. <laughs> or pick a different idea. I don't know. That's usually my thing is like, don't it, raising money is not the best uh, answer when you can go and learn new stuff and you're still young, you should go and try to learn some stuff. It's not, not terribly hard. Uh, sorry for interrupting Ryan, but I know that uh, Q and A ends at seven 
30. So, oh, okay, cool. Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you're not able to answer the last two questions, that's totally fine. Oh, we can do a lot. I think I already asked, asked, answered Sam. So maybe I try um, Yushin. I hope I got, I'm sure I got, did not get the tones correct in your name. I did, I don't see pinion accents on there, so. Oh, that, that's okay. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for sharing today. And uh, I would just like to know if you can give some insights on how you manage time and stay productive mm. with all your responsibilities. Yeah. Um, I go through different cycles on this in different ways uh, of like keep my calendar totally free. So I'm just available and then end up filling it up with stuff. Um, I think those ways I should probably be more consistent in how I do it, but uh, I think that free and available time is super important. I block off two hours every single day and, and I've tried to push it more recently uh, for what I call MIT most important thing. And um, two hours is work on the most important thing in life and nothing else or most important thing at work. Um, and uh, so definitely that's something I'm really religious about having two hours to focus on what is the top priority. Um, don't get spread too thin. Uh, I am very fortunate to have a large organization now. And so one of the cool things about people is that we're all different and we like different things. We have different interests and get energy from different things. So I do a, a quarterly energy audit and I look at my calendar of all the stuff that I've done in the last quarter and I score each item, each meeting as did it give me energy or did it take energy away? And uh, the, I try to keep it 80, 90% green. 100% green, I'm probably hiding from some problems, but uh, 80 or 90% green. And the red stuff, I because people are different, I find somebody else and you'll find that someone else would get energy from that problem, uh, be better at it, enjoy it. And so that's the cool thing about having like a really diverse team with different backgrounds is like, you'll find someone else that likes that kind of stuff that you find terribly boring or draining. Um, so that's been an important part of how I manage time is like try to avoid the stuff that drains me and keep my energy levels high, um, underrated. I don't want to do boring stuff. Uh, but you know, when you were one person, I, I had to do everything, even if it drained me, uh, it was boring. So, but maybe you can outsource that stuff. Um, I think it's very good to have, uh, to value your time and maybe put like an, uh, a fake number about what your time is worth per hour, even if it's not, even if no one's paying you that much. And if it's, if the problem is less, you know, if you can solve it for less than that, send it to that someone else to do it um, and, or just ignore it. I didn't, when I was starting Flexport, I didn't check my physical mail for six years. Um, as more as an experiment than anything else, like what would happen? Nothing bad happened, by the way. The mail is just the US government dropping a bunch of trash at your house every day. It really needs to be, it's really BS. Um, uh, but nothing happened and it really caused a lot of other people a lot of panic that I wasn't opening. You know, I had a whole, by the end, I had a big garbage bin full of letters at my house. Um, but that was me like, I mean, like, it's not a good use of my time looking at mail, like who cares if what's in there? I, I did have like a bad credit score once, but uh, who cares? I'm not borrowing anybody's money. All right, thank you so much for yeah. sharing. Yeah. Um, Sam, did you have one last question or is just your hand still up from before? Oh, okay. I, I Yeah, sorry. Um, but I guess your number gonna be a crazy high number, <laughs> I guess. You'd be surprised if, if, if an entrepreneur has good credit score, they're doing something wrong. Like you need to, you know, run up your no, credit. I'm talking about make... the number you're gonna assign to your rate per hour. Oh, my rate per hour, sorry. I thought you done about my credit score. Um, uh, nowadays I stop, I stop using that mental framework. Now I just say no to everything, unless it's one of my top priorities. Um, but, but when you're getting started, you know, you, have, you might assign yourself a, a high rate of high rate of pay a fictional one, even, uh, and assign yourself some self-worth and don't waste time on stuff that'll, that's worth less than that. Well, okay, everybody. Thank you for hosting me. It was really fun to come back to Cal and I hope y'all are having a lot of fun. Enjoyed Enjoy getting, this was one of those, I'll put this on my calendar as a green thing that gave me energy. So thank you for that. Well, Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, Ryan, for taking the time out of your really busy schedule. Um, I'm, I really learned a lot and I deeply appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. All right, so thank you so much for coming today. So if you're a guest, you're feel free to leave now because we'll be going over something um, for students. So if you're a guest today, so you're welcome to leave.
Um, for the logistics, so just a reminder that February 22nd business model assignment and project assignment four is due this Sunday, 11.59 p.m. And the homework grades are released. So email us if you have any questions about the grades. Um, can you switch to the next slide, please? All right, uh, and Decode is recruiting. So if you're interested in entrepreneurship, Decode is the club for you. So um, in our club, you will get a chance to connect with famous startup founders, uh, host annual conference, and then invite the founders to discuss entrepreneurship and give advice. And you will also have chance joining consulting projects and unique VC fellowship program to learn about how to break into VC from Silicon Valley investor. And you will also get a chance to connect with alums, not only from the listed company in the poster, but also in the startup world. So it only takes you five minutes just to express your interest in our organization. Uh, Decode is the organization that our decal course is under. Yeah. Um, so Serena, can you please switch to the next slide? Um, there's a QR code on there. Yeah, so if you're interested in Decode, just sign up now, uh, scan the QR code, uh, and then the application is due on March 1st. Okay, regarding our future events. So Decode is going to host, negotiate, and choose the right job offer uh, on March 3rd. Uh, 2021 from 6 to 7 p.m. PST. Uh, this time we invited Brian Leo and also Fatumoda Fall from uh, the co-founder of Ralph. Uh, 